Baseball's steroid era. It's kind of hard to know how to feel about it. On the one hand, it represented perhaps the most prolonged period of openly cheating in the history of professional sports. Most of those who participated and excelled in this era will also retain its scars, and some of the best players in history will never be enshrined in Cooperstown as a result. On the other hand, it revitalized a sport that needed it desperately in the wake of the 1994 players' strike, and a waning of interest overall in what had once been America's pastime. It contained some of the greatest performances in baseball history, some of the finest and most unforgettable moments, and damn, was it ever fun to watch. So, for the moment at least, let's set aside our morals and our misgivings, and let's relive the swollen magic and ripped majesty of baseball steroid era in all of its PED-infused glory. Here are the best roided out seasons in baseball history. But before we dig deeper into this concept, I want to ask that if you enjoyed today's video, please consider liking and subscribing. If we hit 3,000 likes in this video, I'll make a part 2, since there are so many roided out seasons that deserve to be appreciated, and I couldn't possibly put them all into one video. Anyway, our first crazy season is actually multiple seasons. Barry Bonds, 2001 to 2004. Every one of these seasons deserves mention, as during this time, he broke the OBP record twice, the home run record, the walk record, the OPS plus record, and countless other hitting records. There were the historic moments, of course, like when he shattered Mark McGuire's single season home run record by blasting 73 in 2001, but records like that tell just a fraction of the story for what was undoubtedly the best statistical stretch in MLB history bar none. During that four-year period, Bonds basically broke baseball's idea for what was possible at the plate. En route to four straight MVP awards, he slashed an insane 349, 559, 809 with 209 home runs. His total F4 was 47.3 over this time, which was actually better than five other teams' entire offenses combined. When it comes to runs created plus, Bonds 2002, 2001, and 2004 campaigns are the first, third, and fourth best offensive seasons of all time. Only Babe Ruth's 1920 campaign sneaks in there along with Barry. Here are some other jaw-dropping numbers from Barry's run on the record book. In 2001, when he hit 73 home runs, he had just 49 singles. But who really needs them when you have 107 extra base hits and 177 walks? Speaking of bases on balls, in 2002, he walked 198 times. Obviously a record. He also hit 370 to win his first batting title at the age of 38. He also broke the OBP record with a 589 mark. In 2003, he took 65.9% of the pitches thrown to him, and still managed to hit 45 homers and slug 749. But it was really in 2004 that Barry became a walking, talking, smashing outlier. At age 40, he had four more home runs than strikeouts, with 45 to 41. Walked a record 232 times, which included 120 intentional bases on balls, surely a number we'll never see again. And all those walks helped contribute to a mind-blowing 609 on base percentage, which is, not considering his own dominance in previous years, by far the best a hitter has ever been at not making outs. More than likely, no major leaguer will ever intimidate pitchers in quite the same way again. Hell, since his run of 240 OPS plus seasons, only one player, Aaron Judge, has even managed to break 200, in a season that saw him hit 62 clean dingers. Barry's records, each of them, are more than likely safe for the foreseeable future, if not ever at this point. Jose Canseco, 1988 If Barry Bonds' performance was the high water mark of the steroid era, it was Jose Canseco's 1988 season that really kicked it off. Hitting 33 home runs and winning the AL Rookie of the Year award at age 22, the 6'3", 230-pound Canseco drew comparisons to Mickey Mantle. With his combination of speed and strength, the muscle-bound youngster also had the physique of a Greek god and was not afraid to show it off. He looked like a cannon about to explode in the batter's box. He would almost dance before every pitch, wiggling, shifting, and twitching. And with what turned out to be performance-enhanced bat speed, he left seasoned veterans gawking. A's coach Dave Duncan once observed to Canseco's bat, it's not a blur, it's invisible. I've never seen bat speed like that. That's how he can hit the pitch that jams other guys into right center field with power. Canseco was also moody, brashy, and cocky as hell. Perhaps that was the steroids as well. Before his sophomore season in 1988, he told reporters that he would be the first player ever to hit 40 home runs and steal 40 bases in a season. And then he proceeded to back up this outlandish prediction by doing just that. Baseball's first ever 40-40 year also came with a 307, 391, 569 slash, and league leading 170 OPS plus. At age 23, Canseco posted what turned out to be his career highs in batting average, OPS plus, stolen bases, doubles, and RBIs. Canseco, through his congressional testimony and best-selling book Juiced, would later prove to be an essential whistleblower in the steroid era. But during that magical summer of 1988, he introduced us all to the stunning strength, power, and agility of steroid-aided play, and we didn't even suspect he was doing them. Or maybe we just didn't want to know. Roger Clemens, 2005 
A 40-year-old Barry Bonds had already blown baseball away multiple seasons by 2004, so in 2005, it seemed only appropriate that a pitcher would do the same. A 41-year-old Roger Clemens was the losing pitcher for the Houston Astros in their Game 7 defeat to the St. Louis Cardinals in the 2004 NLCS. He thought about retiring after that season, only to be given more than 18 million reasons to stick around for one more year, the most annual reasons ever given to a major league pitcher at that point. Clemens had been phenomenal in 2004, going 18-4 with the 2.98 ERA, taking home his seventh Cy Young Award in the process. But somehow, despite his advanced age, he was even better in 2005. Of course, we now know that a huge part of that somehow was PED related. Clemens posted the best ERA plus and ERA of his career that year at 2.26 and 1.87. This seemed impossible at the time, especially coming off a six-year stretch where Clemens was more really good than truly great. Clemens' 1.87 ERA was the lowest by any National Leaguer since Greg Maddox in 1995, and he also led the league in giving up just 6.4 hits per nine innings. The 42-year-old Rocket dominated baseball more thoroughly than he had ever done in his 20s. He also led the league in adjusted ERA, fielding independent pitching, and war among hurlers. But Clemens would go just 13-8 thanks to some anemic run support. In five of his eight losses, he allowed three runs or less, and in all 11 of his no decisions, Clemens allowed two earned runs or less. As a result, Clemens finished just third in the Cy Young voting, behind Dontrell Willis and Chris Carpenter, despite having one of the best pitching seasons in modern history. Gotta love that old school voting approach, right? But either way, this kind of season honestly probably did more to harm his Hall of Fame case than help it. No player had ever done what he did at the age he did it. Perhaps except for Bonds in the box. Mark McGuire, 1998. Okay, let's go back to the other Bash brother. You knew this one was coming. In March 1998, the cover of Sports Illustrated proclaimed, get ready for a slugfest. In previous seasons, baseballs had already started to exit ballparks at increasing rates, and the players who were hitting them were already starting to look more like bodybuilders or wrestlers than baseball players. Most people at the time, including Sports Illustrated Tom Verducci, attributed these developments to increased weight training and supplements, plus how expansion had thinned out MLB pitching staffs. And the poster child for those revamped baseball sluggers was Mark McGuire. The Cardinals' first baseman had always been a home run hitter, launching 49 in his rookie season with the A's in 1987, and route to winning the AL Rookie of the Year. But it wasn't until 10 seasons later, in 1996, that Mark McGuire 2.0 again flirted with 50, blasting 52 that season, and then 58 in 1997. So, coming into 98, it was definitely conceivable that McGuire could hit 62, eclipsing Roger Maris's long-held single-season record. Nobody dreamed that McGuire would break the record in early September, or that the Cubs' Sammy Sosa, and, for a while, the Mariners' Ken Griffey Jr. would give him a run for it. It became the year of the great home run chase, as an America that had been captivated by the Monica Lewinsky scandal turned back to its favorite pastime. And it probably couldn't have been better timing. After the 1994 player strike, baseball was at its absolute lowest. So this period of record chasing really did help bring the game back. Some have even said that this period may have just saved the game entirely in terms of national relevance. McGuire himself survived the intense pressure and spotlight to hit a godlike 70 home runs that season. It seemed like a record that could stand for another 40 years, but in the end, it lasted only three, taken down by the many times mentioned Bonds. The supplement-fueled slugger had a number of crazy seasons in the late 1990s, but it was this year that took the crown. That record-breaking 70 homers, a 216 OPS+, plus, a 752 slugging percentage, and an NL MVP runner-up. He really should have won, all at the age of 34. He would follow this up with two straight seasons where he notched an over 170 OPS+, plus, including a 203 mark in 2000. Sammy Sosa, 2001. McGuire's chief opponent in 1998, Sammy Sosa, was no one-hit wonder either. As good as his 66 home run MVP winning performance had been, the real summer of Sammy arguably came three years later in 2001. In fact, Sosa's whole run between 1998 and 2001 is often overlooked at this point. During that period, he averaged 61 home runs a season, and became the only player to ever hit 60 or more home runs three times. And yet, somehow, he didn't win even a single home run crown during those three seasons that crossed the 60 threshold. If that doesn't perfectly encapsulate the roid-fueled dominance of the era, I don't know what does. In 2001, as Barry Bonds was electrifying baseball with another home run chase, Sosa was having a career season, blasting 29 home runs in the final two months to finish with 64. Nobody really seemed to notice. That year, Sammy set personal bests in runs scored, RBI, walks, batting average, on base percentage, and slugging percentage. He had an incredible, for anyone not named Barry Bonds, 203 OPS+, plus, another career high, and 425 total bases. Sammy also hit a career high in our war this season with 10.3. Sammy, despite always finding himself on the periphery of the spotlight, ended up being overshadowed basically every season he was making his own assault on the record books by either McGuire or later Bonds. 
but still, for a four to five year window in the late 90s and early 2000s, he was arguably the best slugger on the planet, at least until Barry launched himself into the stratosphere. Eric Gagne, 2003. When closer Eric Gagne entered the game at Dodger Stadium, the PA system would blast Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses, and the words Game Over would flash across the scoreboard. And for a multi-year period in the early 2000s, this proved to be a plain fact for all Dodgers opponents. When Gagne entered the game, it was as good as done, as the intimidating reliever converted all 55 save opportunities in 2003, and route to becoming the first pitcher to record 50 saves in more than one season, and the fastest pitcher to ever reach the 100 save mark. What's more, between August 2002 and July 2004, Gagne converted 84 consecutive save chances, a major league record that will more than likely never be broke. Gagne was a beast and looked like no other relief pitcher before him. His fastball could hit triple digits, a rarity at the time, and his Vulcan changeup, gripped with the forefinger and middle finger spread apart from the ring finger and pinky, was nasty playing off of it. It often looked like the right-hander had somehow thrown a left-handed curveball. One of Gagne's catchers said that his changeup spun so fast it would cut your jersey. Oh, yeah, and he mixed in a low to mid 70s buckling curve once in a while, too. Good luck. In that magical season, Gagne used his filthy repertoire in 77 games, allowing just 49 total bases along the way. That came on just 20 walked batters and 37 surrendered hits in 82 and a third innings. He had a 120 ERA and ridiculous 337 ERA plus that season, with a strikeout to walk ratio of 6.85. Gagne would, quite unsurprisingly, win the Rolaids Relief Man of the Year award, while also becoming the first relief pitcher in 11 years to win the Cy Young. He now stands as the most recent, and with seemingly little chance of this feat being repeated going forward, due to the evolution of our understanding of the value of relievers, he'll probably be the last. Going into the 2007 season, Alex Rodriguez's previous performance to the Yankees had been somewhat underwhelming to fans. Despite an enormous paycheck and some decent, for him, regular season numbers, the slugger had hit just 240 with three home runs in 96 playoff plate appearances. Yankees fans were ready to call for his head coming into the campaign, but A-Rod quickly silenced his critics with one of the hottest starts in MLB history. In his first 18 games, he smashed 14 home runs, including two walk-offs, all while hitting over 400 along the way. Rodriguez eventually slowed down, but not before having arguably his best season, hitting 54 home runs, including the 500th of his career, becoming the youngest player ever to reach that milestone. He also slashed 314, 422, 645, with a 176 OPS+, plus, all while driving in 156 runs and scoring 143, both career highs. Rodriguez was named the AL MVP for the third time in his career. It later came out that not only had A-Rod used PEDs during that season, and many others, but he had been given the express written permission of Major League Baseball to do so. Prior to that season, Rodriguez had actually asked for permission to use testosterone, which had been banned by the league since 2003, and two days before spring training, his request was granted. In a crazy twist of legal cheating, Rodriguez took full advantage and elevated his game to yet another level. The Yankees would, however, again falter in the playoffs, with Rodriguez posting good but not great numbers in their ALDS loss to Cleveland. Okay, let's quickly go over a few honorable mentions as well. Manny Ramirez, 2000. That season, it was just Manny being Manny, with of course that extra boost of the juice. Despite playing just 118 games due to some nagging injuries, Ramirez posted a career high 351 batting average, along with 38 home runs and 122 RBI. In what would later prove to be his final game in a Cleveland uniform that season before signing with the Red Sox, Manny launched a home run in front of the Tribe Faithful at Jacobs Field, capping off one of the few seasons in MLE history where a player averaged more than one RBI a game for nearly 120 contests. Ken Cavanetti, 1996 the NL MVP award was won in 1996 by a player who today is probably not known that well by younger generations, Ken Caminetti. The bulked up third baseman, who was more so seen as a glove first player up to that season, performed at levels he had never sniffed before, combining his usual dazzling plays at third with a career year at the plate, batting 326 with 40 home runs, 130 RBIs, and 1,028 OPS. The switch hitter set a major league record by homering from both sides of the plate four times in a game in one season. He even hit two home runs after getting food poisoning in Mexico during a historic series south of the border. Kevin Brown, 1996. That same season, a lanky but muscular Marlins pitcher was dominating from the mound. Brown, the team's ace, had a microscopic 1.8 ERA in an ironclad 233 innings pitched, good enough for a league-leading 7.9 war and 2.15 ERA+. However, in another instance of old-school voting, his 17-11 record paled in comparison to Atlanta hurler John Smoltz's 24 victories, who won the Cy Young over Brown, despite having an ERA that was more than a run higher, and an ERA plus more than 60 points lower. Rafael Palmero, 1999 
fan favorite Palmero returned for his second stint with the Texas Rangers in 1999 at age 34, with most hoping, at the most, for some decent production out of an aging vet. He, with the help of some extracurriculars, turned in much more than that, with the once skinny outfielder turned bulky DH slash first baseman hitting 324 with 47 home runs. He finished fifth in the MVP voting and even won a gold glove at first base despite playing only 28 games in the field. Don't ask. Juan Gonzalez, 1993. Palmero's fellow Ranger and another formerly skinny outfielder, Juan Gonzalez, erupted for his own career season more than half a decade earlier in 1993. That year, he led the AL with 46 home runs and a 632 slugging percentage. In a home run derby showdown with Ken Griffey Jr., Gonzalez amazed the crowd by becoming the first player to hit a home run into the facade of the upper deck in left field at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, a shot estimated at 473 feet. Balls just aren't supposed to go that far to left field in Baltimore. They just aren't, but they sure did that night. So there you go, a catalog of some of the greatest PED infused seasons of all time. The tainted era of steroids will likely always cast a shadow over these accomplishments, making it difficult to know how to feel about them overall. But despite the controversy surrounding the steroid era, it's important to remember that the achievements of players during this time were at least entertaining in the extreme, and certainly worth remembering, even if we may not encounter most of them as we're making our way through the corridors of Cooperstown. Now, Thank you for watching. Again, if you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. As I mentioned before, if we get to 3,000 likes, I'll make a part two with your top suggestions included. Have a great rest of your day.